Hey guys, it's Sung here and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'm going to talk in a way that anyone can understand some recent criticisms that were directed towards index funds by Michael Burry and his concerns that index funds are a bubble. Now, I'm also going to talk about why I think his concerns are misguided and explain why I think index funds are still a solid choice to grow your wealth and achieve early financial independence. So Michael Burry recently did an interview with Bloomberg where he was sharing his concerns that index funds are causing a bubble. If you don't know who Michael Burry is, he is well known in the financial world for having predicted the housing bubble back in 2018 and he made a fortune betting on the housing betting against the housing market. You may also know him as the guy who was portrayed by Christian Bale in the popular 2015 movie called The Big Short. If you have seen some of my other videos, you know I'm a big proponent of low-cost, passive, simple index investing, which is probably by far the most popular investment for the FIRE movement, which stands for Financial Independence Retire Early. So any criticism of index funds or ETFs coming from somebody as well-regarded and as brilliant as Michael Burry is something that I think is worth considering. In this interview, his main criticism I think can be summed up in two points. The first one is price distortion, and the second point is liquidity risk. So his first criticism starts in this paragraph. Index fund inflows are now distorting prices for stocks and bonds in much the same way that CDO purchases did for subprime mortgages more than a decade ago. So how exactly does he think index funds distort these prices? Well, he goes into detail in a later paragraph. He says, passive investing has removed price discovery from the equity markets. The simple theses and the models that get people into sectors, factors, indices, or ETFs and mutual funds mimicking those strategies, these do not require the security level analysis that is required for true price discovery. I am posting a link to this interview down in the description below so that you can read it on your own time if you are interested. And while you're down there, be sure to drop a like to support this video and my channel as well as uh, if you haven't subscribed already, be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss out on any new videos to help you grow your wealth and achieve financial independence. So let's first talk about what is price discovery as it relates to the stock market. So simply put, price discovery is the process in which you go about to figure out what is the price or value of a company. So you may be thinking, well, what does that exactly look like? Well, Here's how you can picture it. Every morning, thousands of Wall Street professionals go to work to analyze thousands of companies to figure out what is the true value of those companies. Once these analysts and traders are able to figure out what they think a company is actually worth, they'll go ahead and look at the stock price and determine if it's undervalued or overvalued or fair valued, and then they'll decide whether to buy, sell, or wait it out. So this is what you would call actively trading. These experts are actively trying to find the opportunities and the price gaps in the stock market to make money. So what Burry is saying is that for passive investing, for example, like buying into the S&P 500 index fund, right? Means you're not doing any price discovery at all. In a sense, you're just buying the stocks of 500 companies in the S&P 500 without any thought for what their true prices are. So there's no expert or, or an analyst behind the index fund letting you know whether or not you're overpaying for the fund company or underpaying for the company. And just as a side note, in regards to his reference to CDOs or collateral debt obligations and their connection to subprime mortgages, that is a very different situation than index fund investing and the stock market or the bond market. Without getting sucked down this rabbit trail, CDOs can be extremely complex investments, whereas I think even a fifth grader can understand in index funds and how they work. So the connection that he's trying to make, I think is a bit of a stretch. And I feel like his motive for even mentioning it in the first place in this interview is more sensational than anything else. Really to hark back to the emotions and the fears and the, and the chaos and the craziness of the last financial crisis. So going back to what Burry is saying, so if you follow his logic, what he's basically saying is that the mass amount of money that is in passive index funds and ETFs have gone so large and nobody's thinking about the prices that they're paying for these companies. And by blindly buying massive amounts of stock of companies that are listed in whatever index, you're basically inflating their stock price beyond what they're actually worth. And therefore, index investing is causing a bubble. Now, Burry is absolutely right in that 
Passive index funds and ETFs have grown tremendously over the last two decades, where now, at least in the United States, passive funds make up close to half of all assets under management. CNBC had published this article about passive investing back in March, and I suspect now that it's probably closer to 50%. And if you look at this chart down here, it shows just how much passively managed funds have grown as a percentage of the market from 2009 to 2018. But the truth is, and this is the key detail that I think you need to realize, that even though passive index funds and ETFs make up a bigger proportion of assets than ever before, they only make up a tiny fraction of all trading activity. And trading is what determines price. In fact, a Vanguard research paper from 2018 states that because index strategies have low turnover and trade at the margin across a large list of securities, their impact on trading activity is minimal. Figure 8, which I'm popping up here, shows that the portfolio management activity of indexing makes up about 5% of daily trading volume on US exchanges. The research paper continues to say, other market participants, including but not limited to retail investors, high frequency traders, and pension funds, account for the vast majority of trading volume active participants play the dominant role in security training, therefore facilitating price discovery. So just because the amount of money in passive index funds and ETFs has grown so much does not mean that prices are being distorted by these funds because they don't buy and sell stock positions all that frequently compared to actively managed funds. If you think about it, and for this we can take a S&P 500 index fund as an example, the only time it would need to buy or sell is when a company is added or dropped from the S&P 500 index. And periodically when changes in the market value of the companies requires adjustments in the market value weightings. This is also true of index ETFs. And if you're not familiar with what ETFs are and how they're different from index funds, I recommend you watch this video up here where I break down the differences and similarities in a way that anyone can understand. Basically, ETF trading volume is almost always the buying and selling of ETF fund units, not the fund's actual stock positions. So in fact, the Vanguard research paper that I had just mentioned, they lay out the facts and the data on this. So I'll link to that paper down in the description so you can go ahead and take a look at it if you're interested in more details. So the bottom line is this, the argument that passive investing is distorting stock prices doesn't make sense because passive funds trade so little. Really the reality is that price discoveries being done by active traders is still alive and well and they're not going to go away anytime soon if ever. With cheaper alternatives to the traditional brokerage account like M1 Finance or Robinhood, Active trading is more accessible than ever before to just about anyone with a phone and internet connection. All you have to do is do a quick search on YouTube to find just about everyone and their moms posting videos on how their Robinhood account is the best thing since sliced bread. All this goes to say that as long as some people somewhere think that they can beat the market, active trading will always exist alongside passive investing. And those active traders will, by their very nature, uh, keep actual prices uh, as close to the true prices in most cases. If you think about it, there can never be a situation where passive investors make 100% of the trades. If that were true and all stocks were bought and sold blindly by passive investors and nobody was doing price discovery, the opportunities to take advantage of the market would be so abundant and easy that everyone would just rush into active trading to profit off of the laziness and or the ignorance of passive investors. So there will always be a balance between uh, passive investors and active traders at all times. Where that balance is, is really hard to say, but I do like Mr. Money Mustache's response to the question of how many active investors does it take to balance the market. He writes, if actively managed funds start consistently outperforming index funds on average across the entire industry, then we have reached a point of peak indexing and you should switch to a good low fee active fund. To summarize, passive investing does not distort stock prices because most trading is done by active investors who through their price discovery keep the market in check. All right, so moving on to liquidity risk. So in the article, 
Here is the paragraph that details his criticism, which I think is a bit unnecessarily convoluted. So I'm not going to read it here, but basically what he is saying is that because there's so much money invested into small and medium sized companies that don't trade very often, if there is a downturn in which there's a mad rush to sell, the prices of these companies will tank and therefore everyone will lose a lot of money. I think this argument is pretty weak because long-term passive investors don't really sell. I mean, they're passive for a reason. These people buy index funds and ETFs regardless of the short-term price fluctuations. And frankly, there's a lot more interesting and volatile assets out there to play that game than boring index funds and ETFs. So if you're part of the fire movement, you definitely don't have any intention of selling due to these big price swings. So I think there is a bit of a misconception on Michael Brewery's part about the type of people who buy into passive index funds and ETFs. But you know, maybe there are people who, uh, who are buying into passive investing without thinking through what they exactly signed up for. And so only time will tell if they have the stomach to ride out those major losses, especially during a recession or a really volatile market. Especially for some of us younger folks who have never experienced a full-blown recession or double-digit losses, I think there's a lesson to be learned in what Michael Burry is saying, in that succeeding as a passive investor requires a great deal of emotional self-control and financial discipline. And for some of us who have only been investing since after the last financial crisis, I don't think we've truly been tested in how much we believe in this passive investing bandwagon. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to drop a like down below. I'd really appreciate it. And be sure to share with a friend if you think they'll find it useful in any way. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss out on any new videos to help you grow your wealth and achieve early financial independence. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.